this is the third edition of a forum with a uncommon and familiar name, Translingual Europe. The very first one we had two years ago here in Berlin in the Ministry of Economics. And since this first event in the series uh, had turned in, a, in, in quite a success and uh, people from many organizations, especially industrial companies, enjoyed very much the opportunity to get uh, in a nutshell information on new developments in research but also new developments in the area of usage of translation technologies and other translingual technologies such as cross-lingual information retrieval, cross-lingual answering, multilingual terminologies, and so on. Uh, they urged us to do this again. And so one year ago, we did it again uh, in Prague, in a, this time in a very historical setting. It was a beautiful Baroque room. Some of you, I recognize your faces, were there last year also. But then there are many new faces today. And uh, again, it was successful, and we continued this now. We are going to continue it, and, and, and uh, you, you know how it is with meetings. Yeah? You can argue about the contents as much as you like. In the end, it's the market. It's the market, and if the room is filled like this, and not only filled, but if you get the right type of people, the right type of provider organizations, of user organizations, of top-level researchers, uh, of people representing language communities, public administrations, then you know you are on the right track. Yeah, there's a market, and we promise the moment you won't come anymore, we'll stop this immediately. Yeah, so that's the promise. And, but right now there seems to be a, a, a really, the demand seems to be even growing, and I will say a few words on why this is so. But before I do this, let me say, why do we come back to Berlin now? Isn't it uh, a little strange for a European traveling conference? Yeah, you go Berlin, Prague, Berlin, and then maybe next time Berlin. <laughs> so why is that? And the reason is pretty simple, because we were able to achieve something that we had thought about before but never realized it, namely to tie it even more closely into, more, even closer into developments in industry, in the localization industry. And so we talked with the makers of localization world, especially Ulrich, who is probably not in the audience today, this morning. He's busy opening the localization world, setting up everything. And uh, we thought it would be a real good idea to have this event be embedded, yeah, embedded. You can say co-located, but then uh, taking the relative sizes of the two event, let's call it embedded, yeah, in the beginning of localization world. And we hope that this will be of mutual benefit, so we are going to study this and see how it works out. But we could already see now by the type and number of registrants, uh, participants, registrants, participants, that it's going to work in the right direction. So it will give people who are more interested in technologies, cross-lingual, translingual technologies, and people who are more interested in the workflows, in the methodology, in new markets, to come together, come closer together, see each other, shake hands, see... Uh, so that um, um, brings up um, a little technicality that I'm going to mention right now already, yeah, that I have to mention it already right now, uh, so that I won't forget get in the end. There will be a few people um, who come only for this event, yeah, or there's quite a number of people who come for this event, quite a number of people for both events. And those among you who are coming only for this event and nevertheless didn't find an air connection back tonight, yeah, only for this event, are not staying for localization world and are nevertheless not going back tonight, there's a possibility for you also, although you are not registered for localization world to participate in um, um, to participate in the uh, opening night reception 
of localization world, but you would have to go and register for that, yeah, because you're not registered for localization world. So you would have to go and get tickets at the reception desk uh, at localization world for, for this event. So tonight, uh, there, there is a restaurant. It's actually outside. Um, if it rains, they also have some place inside. It's next to the river. It's across from an office of a woman you may have heard about, Angela Merkel. So it's uh, so it's across there from there in the at the River Spree in a in a in a very old traditional restaurant. And so if you want to mingle and meet with the people with the other people from localization world who did not fit into this room today, uh, uh, then uh, tonight at Solpakov is the right place. Yeah? So go to Solpakov tonight. That gives you a little map. And if you go to the registration desk of localization world, they will even give you maybe more indications and uh, if they still have also a ticket. Yeah? So that you can go there. So, but before I now, uh, um, uh, before before I now, we now come to the to to the second person who's helping me to to open this event. Yeah, it's too much for me. I know we need to be put two of them, and I'll say in a moment why. Then uh, uh, let me mention another few words of things that we have have observed, and we is the people working now on um, trying to hook up. Um, the most advanced uh, centers and projects in automatic translation going on in Europe with provider and user inter industries. Later you will hear descriptions of these projects uh, and, um, and hear a little bit about latest achievements and directions and latest findings. But uh, right now I want to tell you only some more general, some more general impressions that we gathered. So it turns out that by talking to large users of translation in the European Commission, in the European Parliament, uh, the European Patent Office, all these organizations are also present here, in other large organizations, yeah, large in, 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 in industrial companies, multinational companies in Europe, we see there's almost no player, almost no international player right now who doesn't think or plan or already organize the deployment of machine translation. They all do some do it somewhere. Some are more advanced, some are less advanced. Some have very hard conditions under which to do this because they have very specialized domains and maybe domains that can neither be covered by the existing um, standard technology rule-based system, nor do they have enough data number-wise and parallel prepared for the for successful deployment of statistical methods and these people they are all looking now how to how to uh, which technology would fulfill their needs yeah? and while they are doing it every couple of weeks uh, you yeah, you can already set your clock to it yeah google is putting more languages on google translate yeah so now we have lots of caucasian languages and it's going on it's going on and your favorite dialect or the small language will be on there eventually, I think. Yeah, so it will come up. But nevertheless, so why isn't it the case now that uh, that this settles everything and we say, um, okay, Google Translate does it for all of us. Yeah, hopefully always for free, and all the companies and all the uh, international organizations, all the large uh, public administration uh, users go and uh, use simply this free service and. and and, and then it turns, but then it turns out of this very successful service that we are all very, very grateful for, and and it needs to be there. It's an urgent need, and it's one of the most used services of Google. But if we go to the to the individual organizations, we say we see that this wonderful service does not always fulfill their needs. Not always. That's an not a <laughs> that's an exaggeration. It's an, actually in in many cases, in most cases, it doesn't. Yeah, in most cases, it doesn't. And there are many reasons for that. The one reason is, of course, security. People, companies don't want to put their data there. Another thing is uh, really specialized domains, uh, uh, specialized um, um, requirements when it comes to, 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 qu 
quality uh, when it comes to, uh, to to the possible style. Uh, there's um, lots of uh, so if you, later we will hear some companies talking, but it turned really out that although this was discussed, they are just taking uh, the, the the standard uh, method uh, that for most cases it doesn't suffice. But there's another development now. While this is going to take place, you all also have uh, technology contests, worldwide technology contests, in which the best machine translation systems compete. There are some of them going on in the United States and some of them going on in Europe. You will hear a little report on uh, this year's evaluation of our project Eurometrix Plus uh, and the outcome of this year. And, and we can measure that progress is slow, much, much slower than we all want to be it, but although um, some of us who have been in the field for a very long time, we have, we have been frustrated already for decades yeah, about the slow progress, but nevertheless is, it is there. So it is not, if you if you compare the results from year to year, yeah, there, there is really progress going on by better sophistication of the statistical methods, by combo methods, combining several systems, by hybrid translation methods. So it is there, it is there. If it's fast enough for your needs, yeah, or whether there needs to be something done to speed up progress, that we can maybe discuss at the end of this meeting. But uh, it's clearly there's a growing need, and on the other hand, there's progress, and it's our task somehow to bring these things together. So I think enough said for my part. I want to hand over now to uh, Kim Rossi, who is the um, deputy head of the unit that is responsible responsible for language technology at the European Union level and since he's actually coming from our field, from the field of translation and then also having become very knowledgeable in, in uh, machine translation and technologies, now he is, he, he, is, he is one person who has always urged us and uh, not just urged us but exact, uh, achieved, yeah, setting up connections uh, between research on the one hand, uh, most advanced research in Europe and the large users, the large translation users on the European level. And so we're very grateful for him today and he's going to say a little bit about the topic from his viewpoint of the European Commission. Kim Mo. Welcome everybody from my part as well, and uh, thank you Hans for the nice words. Uh, I haven't missed a single uh, edition of uh, Translingual Europe. I've seen all three of them. And uh, in the first one, I didn't really have much to say, except that uh, it's nice to be in Berlin. Berlin is a nice city. Uh, thank you and goodbye. And the second one in Prague, I, I had so many things to say that I brought along my director and asked him to say the, uh, the many things. Uh, now uh, it's again a different situation, you will notice. Uh, I will make some announcement, I will give some hopefully good news and then some bad news, or actually not bad news, uh, but there are challenges, as we all know. So. I come from the DG Information Society. We, uh, our task is to implement uh, research and innovation programs. I come from Luxembourg, so for those that uh, still persistently think that I come from Brussels. No, I come from, we are based in Luxembourg. So, and the role of European Commission in this, in, in language technology, is um, that we give a few euros to brilliant projects like, like Metanet or Euromatrix Plus. So that's all. We, we don't do much uh, ourselves in terms of implementation. We rely on you. Uh, but euros alone don't really help much if uh, uh, there is uh, no people behind. I, you know that very well. So, I give you a very brief um, uh, outline of where we stand now uh, with language technology. 
uh, EU-funded projects on language technology. I spare you the details of the, the glorious uh, or grim history. Uh, I just look at what we have today. From the calls that we launched uh, and evaluated uh, last year, we have now 26 language technology projects totaling about 60 million euros uh, funding. Uh, we also have a call that just closed uh, 1st of June, uh, not from the research program, but from the innovation program. It's called the ICT-PSP program. Uh, and the topic is multilingual web. It tells it all. And we have uh, an additional budget of 16 million euro to fund maybe six to eight projects. So this call is closed, and in two weeks we will take uh, the proposals that have been submitted and evaluate them. And then uh, at late summer uh, the result will be announced to the lucky winners. But that's not all. Uh, we are still in the process of uh, bootstrapping the European research and innovation in language technology. And we are only halfway in that process, after the, even after this call that we have uh, in our hands right now. Within the next month, there will be two more calls. And this is the big bulk of the material. This is the big uh, uh, funding opportunity ahead. And that's why I wanted to share this with you. Uh, September, we are going to launch uh, an FP7 call, number seven. and. Early next year, 1st of February, we are going to launch an uh, SME initiative. I will tell you later on what SME initiative means. So that hopefully by end of 2011, we will have again uh, a situation that we, we haven't had since many years, since 10 years, that we have about 60, more than 60 running language technology projects totaling a funding of about 130 million euros. So this is the funding, but if you take the total cost, so including the, the partner's own contribution, this is more. It, it is worth about 200 million euros. So uh, we can say that language technology, publicly funded European language technology activity is is um, taking up uh, cruising speed. And by the end of next year, if we translate this amount of money into people, because people are what really matters, it means that we will have six, anything between 600 and 800 full-timers working in these projects at any given moment. So this is the peak. It will take us like one and a half years from now to reach this peak, and then the peak will decline unless we have new calls in the future. But we will reach a peak uh, end of next year, and uh, that pro uh, represents a, a big opportunity for having things done finally, because now we have the resources. So the first call that I mentioned, the first funding opportunity, 50 million, uh, I don't have time to go into details, but I just advertise you that the first topic is more or less uh, business as usual, what you have been used to from last year's call. So those, those who were uh, involved in last year's uh, FP7 call number four, uh, machine translation, multilingual content management, content processing, this represents continuity because we need uh, to have several uh, installments of uh, one particular action. The second one, which is a new theme, is uh, looking at information access and mining. Uh, so uh, the third one is what many of you have been missing, is to start addressing natural spoken interaction, conversational systems, dialogue systems. Um, so, you may say by these three, the three bullet points that you have seen it all already, it has been done already, why bother? 
So that's why we now put a more emphasis on uh, setting up very practical empirical projects, including validation. So to see if it's any good, to put it in real use and see if it's any good. So uh, there will be a lot of integration, a lot of business cases, use cases, which means also that this project will have to, one way or the other, involve users and vendors, providers of the technology. And the good news here is that this is, uh, again, 75% funding. For, so for those who were uh, contemplating whether to uh, submit for this uh, ongoing, uh, or the just closed ICT PSP call, now we have the 75% uh, 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 funding rate back. In ICT PSP, it's only 50%. So. Here it's again the general 75%. Actually, there are three different funding percentages, but I will not complicate uh, you with the details. There are 50, 75, and 100, depending on the nature of the activity. Then about the SME initiative, uh, maybe this requires a bit more explaining. What is this? We have a separate call. So this is not part of call seven launched in September. This is a later separate call that will be launched probably 1st of February 2011. The full name is SME Initiative on Digital Content and Languages. Uh, why SMEs? Uh, simply because SMEs are now important. So if they were not important before, now they are. <laughs> Don't ask any question, just uh, buy it, uh, because uh, uh, it will make uh, it easier um, actually to um, uh, justify uh, these action lines if you take the political signals uh, seriously. And uh, there are uh, several things that actually in Europe SMEs can uh, be providing uh, momentum and fuel for. So uh, this particular uh, digital content uh, languages and data pooling was something thought to be a very uh, fruitful area for SMEs to be involved. So it's a special SME action for adding value by pooling, making available uh, and integrating data in the large sense, not only linguistic data. This is a joint operation that we have with another unit in our directorate, the Inf Intelligent Information Management Unit. So we are handling this call together because handling large amounts of data and pooling them, making them available or building useful, valuable services uh, upon large amounts of data, it's not only about linguistic data, but language plays a big role because a lot of that large amounts of data are text. So it's linguistics, so you need uh, ling uh, linguistic te technologies to make sense of it. So we are now integrating, we are continuing this process of integrating um, the two areas that have been too much separated in the recent past. So uh, information uh, management and language processing. We want to bring them together. So you saw in the previous call there was also this theme, information management, cross-lingual access. That's another part where we are bringing these uh, communities together and, and this is a, another attempt to do it from a different perspective. Because it's a SME action, it has some constraints, we need to have at least two SMEs in the consortium. So that is a sort of eligibility condition. And there's likely to be also a sort of uh, eligibility condition for how much, what percentage of the budget goes to SMEs. Maybe 30% budget must go to SMEs, which means that 70% of the budget can go to, uh, to big companies or to research institutes. So this is not e uh, exclusively SME action, but it needs to have a strong uh, uh, SME dimension. These projects are meant to be fast and small projects, not more than two years uh, duration. Uh, we have a total budget available of 35 million uh, euro for this call. So this is the linguistic and the non-linguistic part together. So you can maybe assume that maybe half of this, uh, approximately half of this, uh, might be interested, uh, interesting uh, for the language technology community because they, uh, we are 
we are handling uh, this language uh, data part of this call. For practical reasons, we have to split them. So you will find under this call separate objectives for the linguistic and the non-linguistic part for practical reasons. And again, it's 75% funding because it is under FP7. Uh, we are facing a big challenge with these two calls. It's not only good news. It may be good news for you, but it is a nightmare for us to, to find subscribers, to find consumers for all this funding. Because the worst thing that can happen to us is that we fight for uh, a work program and we fight for a budget and then there is no subscription, there is no interest in the field. And I'm serious when I say that I need more than 100 new players from this field, and that they will be mostly private companies, not ex uh, exclusively. But because of this practical orientation that we now have, we are now concentrating on innovation, not, no longer research. There is a research aspect, but it is applied research, more applied than ever. Because of this, they would have to come from industry, from business, many of them, most of them. Why 100 plus more? I've done my calculations with the additional number of projects and how many partners we need, how many SMEs we need. Out of these 100, we hope that at least half would be SMEs, or maybe 40. Um, so it's like the people in this room, uh, uh, and uh, considering that it's 130 million euro uh, package by the end of next year, you can all go home with, uh, with a check of one million in your pocket, <laughs> even, even more. But the problem is that many of you already have this check in your pocket, and you cannot really absorb any more. Uh, I'm painfully aware of that, so that I cannot count on all of you. So that's why I say I need 100 plus fresh new players. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. We need good proposals. Help your friends and your business partners in this. Uh, so liaise with them bring them to the, uh, to the uh, consortium, uh, submit good proposals to, together, spread the word. If you are participating, I hope many of you are, are staying here uh, for this um, conference, uh, the Localization World Conference, please spread the word, this gospel, to all of them that we need now consumers for all this budget, all these funding opportunities. To do wonderful things, uh, we need people. We cannot do it with the money. There's a second challenge as well. This is a bit further down the horizon, but not so far, as far as you might think. I can tell you as a background, I was, re uh, for, uh, I was amusing myself uh, in the airplane on the way here, reading uh, about uh, the launch of the planning for the eighth framework program. It's, it's uh, going ahead at full, full speed as we speak. You might think that it's impossible. Uh, the eighth framework program will, will be launched when the current comes to an end, so beginning of 2014. Uh, yes, it, it is possible because it is a huge, large framework program. Uh, the uh, preparations have started and are going on at full speed. And uh, towards the end of the year and early next year, there will be consultations, first internal consultations within uh, the Commission and within the European institutions, with the Parliament. There will be a policy paper on research and innovation. Uh, somewhere beginning of next year. And based on that policy paper, a public consultation will be launched on FP8. Beginning of next year, 2011, for a program that will be launched 2014. Yes, it is possible and it's very true. So, uh, don't think for a second that you can take it easy for two or three years and then uh, things uh, will take shape and you will see what funding opportunities we will have in FP8. We will have nothing unless we convince 
the policymakers in the next 12 months that language technology is worthwhile supporting in the future. So the funding opportunities that we have now ahead of us, the two calls that we have, that might be the end of it if we just uh, don't take this, uh, this seriously. Um, compared to last year, there is now much less political drive for multilingualism. Uh, it's not dropped from the agenda completely, but this is not the, the word of the day. Last year, it still was multilingualism was a very popular topic. Uh, now it's no longer. If you want to hear what is the popular topic right now, it's SMEs and innovation. Big surprise. <laughs> so that's why we are counting on those. Uh, we all know the economic situation, and it's not going to make... Uh, the case easier for multilingualism because people will say, ah, multilingualism is expensive. We cannot afford it uh, in this economic situation. Uh, so the other consequence of uh, economic austerity is strong competition of policy areas. We will have other policy areas competing with language technology in the next framework program, uh, asking for our money, that uh, reallocation. Why give money to language technology when you can give it to something uh, which is more attractive? And then language technology will be challenged. We will be challenged, you will be challenged. Is it any good? Does it really solve the problems? Uh, does it uh, help actually to make multilingualism affordable? We are all con convinced that yes, it does. But it's about, not about you convincing me, but I have to convince and you have to convince the policymakers who will be uh, taking the decisions about the future research and innovation agenda. And it is not by accident that, that, I, that I coin it by research and innovation agenda. Some critics may come to you and say, ah, language technology is already good enough. We don't need public funding for that. We will use Google Translate. <coughs> All public services will use Google Translate and they will cross the language barriers. We have to be prepared for that <coughs> argument as well. So if the first argument fails, they will turn to that argument. <laughs> um, what I want you to, why, why am I telling you this? This is a, a, a battle that will be run on several fronts. It will be within the institutions, certainly, but it will be out there also on the political scene. And if it's within the institutions, we need your help and your support when these consultations, the public consultations or reflection groups are being uh, formed and when uh, uh, input is collected from the outside, you need to be active, and you, you basically have to say you have to say uh, three things. Uh, I don't want to put uh, any words to your mouth, but basically you have to make a convincing case for language technology, the future. Uh, we have a European digital single market, which uh, which. Uh, the politicians and the commissioners like very much. It is your job and my job to say that this digital single market requires that we address the language barriers because nobody understands that right now. Nobody from the, those who are the policymakers actually make this conclusion. We know it, but we have to also make sure others understand it. And we have to also convince policymakers that uh, Crossing language barriers is not a cost. It's not only a cost, but it creates new business opportunities. And it creates business opportunities not only in Europe, but uh, globally. So for European businesses, global business opportunities. And that finally, that language technology can actually make multilingualism affordable. This is so important in this uh, times of economic uh, difficulties, austerity, low budget, cuts in budgets. So 
just to remind you of a few dates in the future we have at the end of September the ICT conference which I hope that uh, many of you will be able to attend that's where we launch the call 7 that I mentioned the 50 million euro big call will be launched uh, uh, in that conference uh, and in November we will have a dedicated information session, different kinds of information and consultation sessions for two reasons. Uh, one thing is to set up partnerships and uh, stimulate good proposals for these new funding opportunities and very important also to collect feedback and to uh, stimulate feedback for the future planning for the next framework program which will be uh, in a very decisive stage uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, we will have the close of the SME call, well, first th stage will close in April 2011 and second stage will close September or October uh, 2011. Uh, this is because this SME call will, from reasons that are not under our control, will be following a two-stage process. So they first submit a short proposal of five pages and then if that one is successful you will be invited to uh, submit a full proposal. So that's why there are two closing dates for that one. This is just to give you a, a preview of what is uh, coming up. And I don't think there is time for questions but I am here all day so I can take questions whenever uh, the, the possibility for discussion arises. Thank you very much.